Hello, and thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Into the Killing. We want to hear from you if you know of any interesting cases we can cover on Into the Killing. If you listen to other episodes, you know that we're looking for cold cases that were eventually solved to cover on the podcast. We're also looking for interesting true crime stories for our YouTube channel, Criminally Listed. We also want to hear from you if you have any interesting stories about anything mysterious and paranormal for our YouTube channel, Paranormally Listed. To suggest cases for the channels and the podcast, please visit our website, criminallylisted.com. For this episode, we're going back to June 1965. On June 7th, 1965, the hardcore legend Michael Foley, better known as Mick Foley, was born in Bloomington, Indiana. From a young age, Mick Foley was fascinated with professional wrestling. In June 1986, when he was 21, he made his professional debut under the name Cactus Jack. After stints in WCW and wrestling in Japan, Foley, wrestling as Cactus Jack, joined the newly rebranded Extreme Championship Wrestling, aka ECW, in 1994. ECW was known for a hardcore style of wrestling which involved weapons like chairs and barbed wire. Foley, a veteran hardcore wrestler who was known to take big bumps, became one of ECW's biggest stars. In 1996, he joined the WWF which later became the WWE, and he rose in the ranks to become one of the most famous and beloved wrestlers of all time. In WWE, he wrestled under the monikers Cactus Jack, Dude Love, Mankind, and once under the name Mick Foley. He had several notable matches, but his most famous one was the Hell in the Cell match with The Undertaker at the King of the Ring pay-per-view on June 28, 1998. If you are not familiar with the Hell in the Cell match, Two wrestlers are locked in a 16 foot tall cage that covers the ring. Before the match, instead of going into the cage, Foley climbed onto the cage's roof and The Undertaker followed. Foley was then thrown off the cage and crashed into the Spanish announcer's table. He climbed again to the roof of the cage. He then fell through the roof of the cage onto the mat below. A folding chair landed on his mouth and broke many of his teeth. Then, finally, he was thrown onto hundreds of thumbtacks spread out on the mat. Foley has many accomplishments, including being a three-time WWE Champion. He is also a New York Times best-selling author. At the time of this recording, 58-year-old Mick Foley is an ambassador for the WWE. At 7.05 a.m. on June 11, 1965, the town of Sanderson, Texas was hit with a flash flood. After several days of heavy rainfall, a 15-foot well of water from Sanderson Creek slammed into the town. It washed away half the community. There were six restaurants in the town, and five were destroyed. Unfortunately, 26 people lost their lives. In the years after the devastating flood, flood control dams have been put in place. On June 15, 1965, Bob Dylan recorded the song, Like a Rolling Stone. Dylan was born Robert Allen Zimmerman in May 1941 in Duluth, Minnesota. Dylan's debut self-titled album was released in 1962. With well, a folk singer's breakout record was a sophomore record in 1963, The Free Will and Bob Dylan. It included the classic song, Blowin' in the Wind. Dylan recorded Like a Rolling Stone in Studio A of Columbia Records in New York City for his album, Highway 61 Revisited, which was released in August 1965. The song peaked at number two on the Billboard Hot 200. But the song proved to be beloved and influential. In 2004 and 2010, when Rolling Stone magazine released their list of the 500 greatest songs of all time, they named it the best song. In their 2021 list, Rolling Stone said it was the fourth best song. Aretha Franklin's Respect, Fight the Power by Public Enemy, and A Change is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke all ranked higher. In 1988, Dylan was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and in 2016, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. In 2023, Bob Dylan released his 40th studio album, Shadow Kingdom. On June 6, 1965, the number one song was Back in My Arms Again by The Supremes. The number one movie was the mega smash hit, The Sound of Music. In 1965, Cheryl Burnett was 19 years old. She was living with her two-year-old son in El Cajon, California. El Cajon is in San Diego County. In the 1960s, the city was expanding rapidly. According to the 1960 census, 37,618 people lived there 
And then, in 1970, it was home to 52,273 people. Burnett was recently divorced from her high school sweetheart. She was well-liked in her apartment building. Some of the neighbors called her Cinderella because they thought she was so attractive. Burnett taught dance lessons to children. On June 6, 1965, the neighbors were alarmed when they saw Burnett's two-year-old son wandering around the apartment building. A neighbor went to show Burnett's apartment and found her new dead body in her bed. The neighbor called the police. The 19-year-old single mother had been raped and strangled to death with a curtain cord. The cord was still tied tightly around her neck. On her face was a black slip that did not belong to her. Around her body there were lit last rite candles. Another candle had been inserted into her vagina. The police cleared her ex-husband and two men she was dating as suspects. The police did have one unusual suspect in the case. It was a Catholic priest. At the time of the murder, Burnett had been planning on joining the Catholic Church. She was getting private catechism lessons from Father Lucian Lowerman, who went by his middle name, John. Burnett had told several friends that she was close to the priest. Because of the last rite candles that were around her body, the police thought that the priest was a viable suspect. He was interviewed, and he denied having anything to do with the murder. Then, a few days later, a waitress from a local bar contacted the police. She explained that Father Lowerman was a regular at the bar. The night after the body was found, Lowerman came into the bar and he had scratches on his face. After a few drinks, Lowerman told the waitress that he had killed Cheryl Burnett. However, the police couldn't find any evidence to connect him to the murder. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before the case went cold. We're just going to take a quick break from this episode to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, Factor. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating better every day easy. Wherever tomorrow takes you, be ready with pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. You'll have over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan to veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. What are you waiting for? Get started today and have a feel-good week of meals ready to go. When I heard about Factor, I immediately thought, where have you been my entire adult life? This is something I've always wanted. I'm terrible with time management and meal planning, so I'm always looking for something quick and easy to eat. But then I end up eating this ultra processed food that doesn't taste very good. I'd eat it just to save time. Or I get food delivered and I pay crazy delivery fees. Plus, I'm notorious for ordering too much food to justify paying those outrageous fees. After years of eating that stuff, I'm overweight and I never feel like I have enough energy. So I was really excited to discover Factor. Their two minute meals are restaurant quality, but less expensive. They're upscale, but easy meals. You just heat and eat their dietitian approved meals whenever you want. On top of having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they also have snacks, smoothies, and more. So you can get an entire day's worth of delicious and nutritious food from them. One thing I love about Factor is that their meals are no prep and no mess because they are 100% ready to heat and eat. Factor is also flexible. You can get six to eight meals a week and pause or reschedule your deliveries to suit your needs. And have I mentioned how good the food is? You should go to the website and check out their meals right now. Head to factormeals.com slash listed50 and use the code listed50 to get 50% off. That's code listed50 at factormeals.com slash listed50 to get 50% off. 34 long years went by. Then in 1999, the case was reopened and the investigators made some shocking discoveries. A lot of change in the nearly three and a half decades. In 1965, the three biggest movies were The Sound of Music, Dr. Savago, and Thunderball. Thunderball was the fourth movie in the James Bond Eon series. It starred the actor they first cast in the role, Sean Connery. In 1999, Eon released the 19th film in the series, The World Is Not Enough, starring the fifth actor to play James Bond in the series, Pierce Brosnan. In 1999, the three biggest movies at the American box office were Star Wars Episode One, The Phantom Menace, The Sixth Sense, and Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me. 
Austin Powers follows the titular character who traveled in time from 1967, two years before the murder was committed, to 1997, two years before the case was reopened. 1965, Wooly Bully by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, I Can't Help Myself, Sugar Pie, Honey Bunch by the Four Tops, and I Can't Get No Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones were the top three songs on the Billboard charts. At the end of the millennium, the three biggest songs were Believe by Cher, No Scrubs by TLC, and Angel of Mine by Monica. Popular books published in 1965 include The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary, The Autobiography of Malcolm X by Malcolm X, and God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater by Kurt Vonnegut. In 1999, some popular books included The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chbosky, A Walk to Remember by Nicholas Sparks, and the first book in a series of Unfortunate Events series, The Bad Beginning by Lemony Snicket, whose real name is Daniel Handler. In 1965, the first cordless phones were released, Kevlar synthetic fiber was developed, and the toy CNC was available to purchase. If you're hungry, you could eat SpaghettiOs, Yoplait yogurt, and Easy Cheese, more commonly known as spray cheese or cheese in a can. In 1999, TiVo was released, as was the novelty item Big Mouth Billy Bass and Sega released their ill-fated Dreamcast game console. For snacks, you get Takis and drink Henrik's Gin and Sierra Mist. In 1999, a DNA expert examined Cheryl Burnett's bedsheet, which had been saved in evidence. She found semen on it. From the semen, she created a DNA profile. A match to the DNA was found, but it wasn't to an individual. Instead, it was a match to another crime scene. The crime happened about two miles from Burnett's apartment, nearly three weeks after she was killed. Lewis and Lola Mercer had been married for over 28 years. They had one daughter together. On June 24, 1965, neighbors heard Lola screaming, so they called the police. When the police got to the couple's apartment, which they had only moved into five days earlier, they discovered a disturbing crime scene. 62-year-old Lewis and 57-year-old Lola were in bed when someone broke in. The intruder bashed them both in the head with a socket wrench. He then raped Lola. 62-year-old Lewis was struck 20 times in the head and he died from his injuries. Lola survived, but she suffered permanent brain damage. So while the police connected the two murders, they still did not know who the DNA belonged to. The police decided to see if the DNA matched the prime suspect, Father John Lowerman. They learned that the priest had died 27 years earlier in 1972 at age 51. In January 2000, his body was exhumed. A DNA sample was taken. His DNA did not match the DNA from the crime scenes, so after 35 years, he was eliminated as a suspect. However, the police were not out of suspects. Two weeks after the Mercers were attacked, on July 5, 1965, a man broke into the apartment of a female nurse in La Mesa, California. La Mesa is about six miles away from El Cajon. She had been raped and nearly stomped to death. The police talked to her neighbors. One of them had encountered a prowler a few days before the attack and he had run him off. He saw the man get into a car and drive away. The neighbor had managed to write down the license plate. The police tracked down the car and it belonged to 27-year-old Clyde Carl Wilkerson. The police had Wilkerson stand in a police lineup. The nurse who was attacked viewed the lineup and she identified him as the man who raped and nearly killed her. Wilkerson was arrested and held in jail until his trial. A detective tried to interview him in jail regarding the attack on the Mercers, but Wilkerson refused to talk. In November 1965, Clyde Wilkerson was convicted of raping and nearly killing the nurse, and he was sentenced to five years to life in prison. The cold case investigators working on Cheryl Burnett and Lewis Mercer's murders decided to investigate Clyde Wilkerson's history. They learned that Wilkerson was born in November 1938 in Willows, California. 
In 1944, his family moved to the San Diego area. Wilgerson had a criminal record that stemmed back to his youth. Between 1945, when he was seven, and until he was 18, he was in and out of the California Youth Authority. In 1960, he was sentenced to 15 months in prison for a series of burglaries. In 1962, he was convicted of assaulting another inmate. He was sentenced to six months to five years. He was paroled in 1964. In April 1965, he was accused of raping a 65-year-old woman in her house. However, since the woman couldn't identify her attacker, he was never formally charged. Months later, in June 1965, Cheryl Burnett was murdered. Less than three weeks later, Lewis and Lola Mercer were attacked. A month after that, Wilkerson was arrested after raping and nearly killing the nurse. After serving about eight years in prison, Wilkerson was paroled in February 1973 and he settled in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This was not the end of Wilkerson's criminal activity. On January 25, 1976, Wilkerson was in Jasona, Arkansas. He came across a woman who was using a payphone. He raped her at knife point but left her alive. She called the police and described her attacker and his car. Wilkerson was arrested. He was convicted and sentenced to 30 years in prison. He was paroled after serving only eight years in prison. In June 1985, about a year and a half after he was paroled, he was in Texas. He was arrested for aggravated assault, but the outcome of that arrest is unknown. In March 1987, Wilkerson was arrested yet again. This time he was arrested in St. Augustine, Florida for selling a controlled substance and parole violations. He was released in 1993 after serving about six years of prison. He worked as a long-haul truck driver between 1995 and 1997, and then again between 1999 and 2000. He quit in 2000 after he was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. The cold case investigators contacted the trucking company where Wilkerson last worked and asked if they kept any records on Wilkerson. When the company's truck drivers were on the road, they were supposed to mail things, like receipts, to the head office. The company had saved some of Wilkerson's envelopes and sent them to the police. A forensic expert was able to get a DNA sample from the envelopes. It was then compared to the DNA at the two crime scenes. It was a match. In October 2002, the police in El Cajon went to Clyde Wilkerson's home in Haskell, Arkansas and arrested him. Initially, Wilkerson thought he was being arrested because he had a methamphetamine lab in his home. The police then told him that he was being arrested for the murders of Cheryl Burnett and Louis Mercer and the attempted murder of Lola Mercer. He eventually confessed to the murders. The police were sure that he committed other homicides. They knew that from 1973 to 1975, he lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There was a series of murders that started in February 1975, 10 years after Cheryl Burnett and Louis Mercer were killed. On February 4, 1975, a 7.3 earthquake occurred in Haishang, Liaoning Province, China. Chinese authorities claimed that they had predicted the earthquake thanks to a study of seismic activity months earlier and four shocks in the days before. So they were able to evacuate the city and there were only 300 deaths. It was credited as the first predicted earthquake in history, but people outside of China were skeptical. It was during China's Cultural Revolution and it would have greatly benefited the government if people believed that they could predict earthquakes. Also, there was another earthquake in China the following year and they did not predict it. In that earthquake, nearly a quarter of a million people died. In 2006, a group of international scientists were given access to the records. They concluded that the February 1975 earthquake was not predicted. There was no evidence to back up that they predicted it. Also, the death toll was higher than 300. The experts thought it was over 2,000. However, that death toll is still low, considering the population of the city was about a million people. The experts believe that the low death rate was because the earthquake happened at 7.36 p.m. 
so people were away, and many people were not at work. Also, the homes of the city were well constructed. A lot of deaths happened after the initial earthquake. Many residents were forced to live in self-made tents constructed from tree branches and bed sheets. It was winter, and many people froze to death. There were also fires caused by people cooking and trying to stay warm. This led to people burning to death. On February 6, 1975, there was an art heist at the Ducal Palace in Urbino, Italy. The palace is an important renaissance building. The thieves climbed the scaffolding set up for restoration work, broke a window, and entered the palace. They cut three renaissance paintings, Raphael's The Portrait of a Young Woman, also known as La Muta, and Piero de Lala Fresca's Madonna of the Sangala and the Flagellation of Christ out of their frames and escaped with them. The value of the paintings wasn't known because they had not been on the market in years, but they were most likely worth millions. The police called it the greatest art theft in modern Italy. Just over a year later, in March 1976, the three paintings were found undamaged in a hotel room in Lorcano, Switzerland. One man was arrested in connection with the heist, but it's unclear if he was ever convicted. At 8.46 a.m. on February 28, 1975, in London, England, a Northern City Line train failed to stop at the Moorgate station. It crashed into a wall. The first and last cars were forced into the roof while the mill car remained on the tracks. The front car was 52 feet long, but after the crash, it was just 20 feet long. 43 people were killed and 74 were injured. It was the worst peacetime accident in London's underground. An investigation revealed that there was nothing wrong with the train or the track. Instead, the crash was caused by 56-year-old driver Leslie Newson, who failed to apply the brakes. Newson was killed on impact. Three years later, the Murgate Protection System was introduced. It applies the brakes if a train is traveling too fast and the driver fails to use them at a stop. On February 5, 1975, the number one song was fired by the funk band, The Ohio Players, and the number one movie was Mel Brooks's comedy horror, Young Frankenstein. The movie reached number one seven weeks after it was released. It is considered one of the best comedies ever made. Mel Brooks thinks it's his finest movie, but not his funniest. He thinks his funniest film is Blazing Saddles. In February 1975, 28-year-old Geraldine Martin lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Martin was twice divorced and had moved to the city about six months earlier from Conway, Arkansas. In Tulsa, she worked as an accountant at a law firm. On February 5, 1975, Martin left work at about 5.30 p.m. She then went to an art class at Tulsa Junior College. She left the class early and went to the administration office where she called a friend. She was going to have dinner at the friend's home and she called to tell her that she was on her way. But she did not show up. The next day a man tried to use her credit card at the Wilco department store in Tulsa. The cashier noticed that the credit card was splattered with blood. The cashier notified the security guard. When the man saw the security guard, he ran away. The guard gave chase, but he lost the man. An employee at the store called the police. The police investigated and discovered that Geraldine Martin was missing. They found her car parked about two blocks from the college campus. There were no clues to her whereabouts in the car. The police believed that she was kidnapped on her way from the campus to her car. The police tried to find the man who used the credit card, but couldn't. They were not sure if he was involved in Martin's disappearance or if he just found the credit card. But it also turned out that a man had cashed a $98 check for Martin's bank account. The man who cashed the check matched the description of the man who tried to use the credit card. Two and a half weeks after Geraldine Martin went missing, on February 24, 1975, some construction workers were doing work on an abandoned apartment complex in Tulsa. In the closet of one of the apartments, they found the new dead body of 28-year-old Geraldine Martin. In the apartment were her clothes. She had been raped and strangled to death with a cord. Her breasts had been mutilated. Part of her breasts were missing. It's suspected that the killer took it with him as a souvenir. 
After the murder, the FBI released a sketch of a man who cashed the check and tried to use the credit card. It did not lead to an arrest. On April 24th, 1975, three months after Geraldine Martin was murdered, the body of another young woman was found. The body was dumped in a wooded area outside of Tulsa. She was identified as 16-year-old Marion Hope Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum was a bit of a wild child. She had run away from a girl's training school a year earlier. For the previous two months, she had worked as a go-go dancer at an establishment called Satan's Bar in Tulsa. The night before her body was found, Rosenbaum worked at the bar. Afterward, around 3 a.m., her friends dropped her off at a supermarket. She said she planned on buying some groceries, and then she was going to walk to the apartment that she shared with her boyfriend. But she never made it there. Her clothes were found near her body. It was determined that she had been sexually assaulted. She had been stabbed 65 times in the chest, back, neck, and face. She had nearly been decapitated. It's believed that the murder weapon was a butcher knife, which was never found. In the media, there was some speculation that Rosenbaum's murder was connected to two other murders. One was Geraldine Martin's murder, and the other was a murder that happened over a year earlier. On New Year's Eve 1973, 22-year-old Sharon Maudlin was working at a bar in Tulsa. She had only moved to Tulsa weeks earlier after growing up in Oklahoma City. While she worked, she danced with several men. A friend was supposed to pick her up at the end of the night. But when her friend arrived, Maudlin was no longer there. Just before noon on New Year's Day 1974, Maudlin's dead body was found on a frozen pond in a strip mine just outside of Tulsa. She had been stabbed over a hundred times. It's believed that the murder weapon was an ice pick. The toxicology report indicated that Maudlin had alcohol and heroin in her system. The police developed a suspect, 26-year-old Michael Woodley. He was at the bar on the night of the murder, and he was one of the men who danced with Maudlin. Woodley had served in Vietnam as an army medic. Since returning, he was suffering from mental health problems. On January 10, 1974, nine days after the murder, Woodley checked himself into a veteran's hospital because of his mental health problems. The police got the pants he was wearing the night of the murder. They gave it to the FBI, who used a special vacuum on it. They found a single hair. The police believed it was a strand of pubic hair that belonged to Maudlin. In August 1974, Woodley was charged with second-degree murder. But four months later, the charges were dismissed due to a lack of evidence. The case went cold again. On August 26, 1975, three months after Marion Rosenbaum was killed, 24-year-old Susan Oakley went jogging along the Arkansas River in Tulsa. Oakley grew up in Lubbock, Texas. After graduating from high school, she attended Oral Roberts University in Tulsa. She got a degree in social work. After completing school, she got a job with the Tulsa Metropolitan Area Planning Commission. It was an experimental program to get citizens involved with city planning. She wanted to do some missionary work in Israel. To help get ready for her trip to Israel, she decided to take up jogging again. The day after Oakley went jogging, she didn't show up for work and was reported missing. Later that day, a reverend who was jogging along the river found her body in some brush. She had been raped, struggled with a blunt object, stabbed, and strangled with her bra. Her body had not been mutilated. However, the police suspected that the killer planned to, but something scared him away. The police thought that at least three of the four murders were connected. They believed that the murders of Geraldine Martin, Marion Rosenbaum, and Suzanne Oakley were all committed by the same person. They were all committed in the Tulsa area within seven months of each other. All the murders have been incredibly violent. 
The police did not explain why they did not consider Sharon Maudlin to be another victim of the killer. But it could have been because she was killed a year before the first murder. Also, she had been killed with an ice pick, where the rest of the women were killed with a knife. However, this is only speculation. In November 2002, the police and Al Cajon contacted the Tulsa police and asked them if they could connect Clyde Wilkerson to any of the murders. There was DNA evidence from the murder of Geraldine Martin. They compared it to Wilkerson's DNA and it was a match. The authorities in Alcohol decided to only try Wilkerson for the murder of Lewis Mercer. In March 2003, Wilkerson pleaded guilty. A month later, he was sentenced to life with a possibility of parole after seven years. However, the prosecution said they did not think he would ever get paroled. In April 2003, Wilkerson was charged with the murder of Geraldine Martin. A year later, in April 2004, he pleaded guilty to the murder. He was given another life sentence with a possibility of parole after 20 years. Although he was only charged with Geraldine Martin's murder, he was the prime suspect in the murders of Marion Rosenbaum and Suzanne Oakley. The police have not said if he is the suspect in the murder of Sharon Maudlin, but he was living in Tulsa when Maudlin was killed. He moved there in February 1973 and she was killed on January 1st, 1974. Nevertheless, her murder remains unsolved. The police do not believe that these were the only murders that Clyde Wilkerson committed. He is also the prime suspect in the murder of 25-year-old William Lawrence Dowd. Dowd got his degree from Caltech and in June 1965, he was working on his doctorate in science at the University of California at San Diego. He was researching the origin and variation of nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas. His professors believed his research would have provided clues about life on other planets. He was considered brilliant and he was well liked on campus. People thought he was easygoing. His nickname was Happy Bill. On June 12, 1965, Dow went on a date with his fiance. The next day, he was supposed to go to the beach with her. His fiance went to his home and discovered that his apartment had been ransacked. On the living room floor was the dead body of 25 year old William Dowd. It's believed that he found someone burglarizing his apartment when he came home from his date. There was a struggle, and the burglar beat him to death with a blunt object. The murder happened eight days after the murder of Cheryl Burnett and nine days before the Mercers were attacked. Besides the six murders that we talked about in this episode, which were Cheryl Burnett, William Dowd, Louis Mercer, Geraldine Martin, Marion Rosenbaum, and Suzanne Oakley, the police believe that Clyde Wilkerson killed at least nine other people. The police said that he is the prime suspect in a murder and attempted murder that happened in 1954 in Los Angeles County. We looked for the case, but we could not find it. What we do know is that Wilkerson would have been 15 or 16 when these crimes were committed. If he did commit that murder, it would have been the first one he committed. What is known is that Wilkerson lived in California, Texas, Oklahoma, and Florida. He also worked as a long-haul truck driver from 1995 to 1997 and from 1999 to 2000, so he traveled to different states and may have committed other murders on his routes. However, we may never know how many murders Clyde Wilkerson committed. He died in prison on June 12, 2016 at age 77. He took his true body count to his grave. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you have any cases to suggest for Into the Killing, Paranormally Listed, or Criminally Listed, please visit our website, criminallylisted.com. Well, that's all for this week. Thank you again for listening. Please stay safe and take care of yourself.